Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leadership in the C-Suite, an important segment of our LMU Business Insights webinar series. My name is Nola Wantem, the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business Administration here at LMU. As we transition to our post-pandemic life, we hope to provide you insights in how to lead and how to see the world with new perspectives. For those of you who have not joined us before, our LMU Business Insights webinar series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the business and global community. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a few webinar, webinar guidelines here. So um, please type your questions in the Q&A window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation. Also, please feel free to use the chat window to post your insights or comments um, to everyone in the webinar and also to our speakers and guests. And also a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available a little, at a later time after the presentation. So we are excited to launch our fall leadership in the C-suite series with a discussion on leading innovation. Business leaders today are not only challenged by uncertainty, but also general management of the intersection of social issues, uh, technology, environment, economics, and politics. We will be bringing C-level exec level executives to speak with our very own LMU College of Business Administration leader, Dean Dale Smith, where they will discuss how these courageous individuals are leading and managing during these unprecedented times. Today, we bring you Mr. Mohan Maheswaran, President and CEO of Semtech Corporation, who will be introduced by our fearless, fearless leader, Dean Dale Smith. Over to you, Dale. Thank you, Nola, and welcome everyone. On behalf of the College of Business Administration, uh, thanks for joining us for our fall series, Leadership from the C-Suite. Before we begin our conversation, let me tell you just a few things about Mohan. Um, the, his education captures that intersection between engineering and business. He holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering and an MBA from top institutions in the United Kingdom. He is a corporate leader. He's an entrepreneur. He's had an amazing career with stints at Nortel, Hewlett Packard, Texas Instruments, IBM. He's been part of the startup culture and he's led marketing, design, development, applications, business development and strategy in a very long and notable career, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot about that this evening. Currently, he's the president and CEO of Semtech, a leading global supplier of innovative semiconductor products. His proprietary platforms are making waves in the semiconductor sector, differentiating themselves by the kind of innovation they do, size, efficiency, performance, and global reach. Perhaps most exciting, is that the products have resulted in being a true leader in multinational technology innovation, enabling solutions that fuel a safer, more productive, more sustainable and socially focused planet. So now you kind of know why I wanted him to kick off our fall series. We'll talk about some of that technology tonight, but let me assure you, it is his children, he's got three of them and his four granddaughters that he's ultimately accountable to. And he shared with me that he's trying to exert the kind of leadership to make them proud, to solve the world's problems and design things that make a difference in our lives and on the planet. In short, Mohan Meswaran is a triple bottom line oriented leader. So please join me in that uh, virtual applause of welcoming Mohan to LMU. Mohan, welcome. Thank you. That was, uh, I think I'm gonna have to hire you, Dale. <laughs> In our marketing department. <laughs> well, I'm sure, you know, if you could give me some sustainability stuff to work on, I, I, I might be convinced to leave LMU. But I'll tell you, in the C-suite series that we do, the question that, of course, everyone wants to know is the one about the journey. Um, and maybe you could share with us a little bit about your global journey to the C-suite. How did you end up as CEO and president at Semtech? Yeah, so I, I'm happy to do that. My, my journey has been, um, you know, I've been 40 years now in the tech industry. Um, and the, the last 15 of those years, I've been the president and CEO of Semtech. And so uh, it's been a while, uh, but um, to get there, you know, I, I, I worked really hard. It was a lot of perseverance. I, you know, I started off uh, in the UK. That's where I studied. I studied in the UK. You'll sense a, a little bit of an English accent and when I talk, um, but, I, but I, I graduated from Surrey University in electronics engineering. Um, and uh, then I went, uh, started my first job as a design engineer. I was very excited to do design work. I actually started my work in doing design 
And one of the first things I remember, and I always tell this story to any graduates or younger students who are learning, I got into the office and I'm very excited to get into the office and um, they appointed me a, a manager. And the manager, the first job he gave me was to clean the floor and, 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 and clean up the labs. And, and I felt you know, very disappointed, <laughs> but I, I'm sitting there and I say, okay, that's what they asked you to do. So I cleaned the floor, I cleaned the labs and he was actually surprised I did it so quickly. So he gave me another job. He said, okay, I need you to fix all these things. So I, I fixed everything. And then he says, well, you know, he, he pointed out that I'm starting to make uh, him look bad because I'm working so hard. And so <laughs> I, I realized that, you know, maybe I'm setting a higher bar than, than he, this guy. So he actually talked to his manager and they pointed me, they put me in, um, uh, gave me another manager. This is my first ever job in industry. And uh, that manager gave me a project to do. And, you know, I, I, my, I learned from that very early on that, uh, you know, you have to work hard and you have to, you have to demonstrate that you're able to kind of keep raising the bar even on your manager. Uh, and that's what I've, I've done. So I started off as a design engineer. I spent many years doing design for Nortel, uh, for Hewlett Packard. Um, I then spent 10 years with a company called Texas Instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas Instruments is a large chip company in, in, uh, in Texas. Uh, they hired me in Bedford, UK, and then they moved me to Texas. Uh, I enjoyed my time at, at TI. <laughs> that's I, a real change. That's a big change. And that, that's one of the, the big moves I made with my family, with my wife, with my kids. That was a joint decision, you know, and actually Texas Instruments gave me the choice of either moving to Texas or moving to Southern France, uh, Nice in Southern France. But I used to go to Nice a lot and, and, you know, I would tell my wife, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful place to visit, but if you're going to work there, it's, it's really, there's not a good career. It's not a good place for a career. Uh, and to be honest with you, I didn't enjoy the culture in Southern France that much. So, but we love Texas. It was very nice. So, so um, enjoyed it very much. But so I moved to Texas, moved the family to Texas um, after, and I did an MBA. I did an MBA, uh, which I think is, you know, for everyone listening who's uh, a student, um, I did it after probably about 12 years of industry engineering experience. And I would say the MBA was just incredibly valuable to me. Uh, I was a techie, you know, I, I, I liked technology. I would open up computers, fix stuff. I, you know, that's what I wanted to do. But then running a business, you know, I really didn't know anything about operations or future human resources or, you know, finance. Or, you know, I didn't know any of these things. Mm -hmm. I, and, I, and as an engineer, an arrogant, you know, technologist, I would think, well, those things are easy, right? I don't have to worry about that stuff, but, you know? So it was, uh, but it was, it was a eye-opening to me really to, to learn that. And so the MBA at Henley Management College in the UK was very, very good for me. And, and I, I went, and after that, I, I joined IBM. I was one of the youngest vice presidents at IBM. Uh, I spent uh, a couple of years at IBM but I really didn't like the East Coast. It was for me, it was cold and it was hard for me. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a warm weather person, as you can see from the background here. Yeah, I, I really needed the sun uh, and my family did as well. So we moved to Silicon Valley. That was when I did my first startup. Um, and in one year that company was acquired. Um, and so, you know, I, I found, um, and this is the interesting part of the journey. You know, my, I had always worked with big companies, large companies, large corporations. And then I, I did a, a startup, which was a very different experience for me. Um, I actually found it very stressful. It was actually a very stressful um, thing to do a startup. But obviously, when you get acquired, you know, it's a large financial reward. And you sit back and you say, and I was young then, uh, younger than <laughs> I, was, I was, I would sit back and say, you know, this, this is not too bad. You know, if you can do this and work hard and have a nice exit, it's fine. Um, so I did that, and then I, I did a couple of other things where, again, uh, where I was acquired. And then Semtec approached me and uh, asked me to uh, move to Southern California from Northern California. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I was never a big fan of Northern California. I just didn't like it. The weather's much. way better here. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. And, you know, it was more, you know, my, my kids are very artistic. My wife is very artistic, and they, they really didn't feel free in Northern California. It was a lot about technology and, and, and uh, you know, the, it wasn't, a, there wasn't the same spiritual kind of feeling that they, they have down in Southern California. So when we came down to Southern California, um, you know, they, they really enjoyed it. And so I was happy. And so Semtech um, 
asked me to be the CEO and, and I've been here for the last 15 years and it's been a wonderful journey, uh, really, actually a very, very good experience with Semtech. Yeah. You, know, you know, it's funny when you talk about and you've been the CEO for the last 15 years, you know, one of the things that always strikes me about that is what's the average tenure of a CEO? It's unusual to see somebody um, doing, you know, 15 years in the same position. So clearly something about Semtech is, is, is keeping you there because I noticed the red wine, which is starting to look pretty good right about this hour, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's your fault, Dale, for say, you know, <laughs> starting later than we had planned for, but, uh, you know, I think um, why have I been able to survive 15 years and why Semtech is doing well is the company, you know, when, we, when I look at the performance of a company or any business, I always look longer term. And, and it's, for me, that is very important. You know, you can't, go into a business, the way we are measured typically you know, CEOs is every quarter, right? Your quarterly results, quarterly results, quarterly results. How are you doing? You know, you have to do all the right things to achieve um, the quarter results, deliver uh, value to your shareholders, but on a sequential quarterly basis, because if you don't, then there's a lot of criticism, right? Mm -hmm. So the one thing that I did when I joined Semtech was I worked with my board of directors and, and our shareholders to say, look, you know, this is a long-term journey. Mm. Uh, and, and we have to understand that, especially in our field of technology, and we'll talk more about that, that some of these investments take a long time to mature. Um, and uh, Laura, which we'll talk about, has been a 15-year journey. You know, right. it's been a long-term journey, but now it's changing the world. And so, you know, when you invest in long-term technology platforms, you have to be patient. And, mm -hmm. and you can't be, you know, I need to show a return immediately. So, so and this is the double-edged sword of, of technology and it's also the double-edged sword of invest, investments and, and, you know, making money and all these type of things is that, you know, everybody wants to make a quick buck, but sometimes you have to be patient. And mm -hmm. so I'm fortunate that my board was prepared to, to be patient. Uh, my investors were prepared to be patient. And as we gradually started to show progress, they started to sit back and say, hey, we, we like what we see. Can you show us some more? And then we'd show them some more and then you know everything would go fine. And if I look back at it now, when I joined Semtech, we were a $200 million company. Today, we're almost a billion dollar company. You know, we were generating you know, 10 cents of EPS. Today, we're generating almost $3 of EPS. You know, we were generating, um, you know, if you look at the company, we had one or two nice products. Today, we have a portfolio of products that are leading edge across the globe um you know yeah, really so we should have met we should have met about 12 years ago i would have uh, <laughs> i would have enjoyed knowing that that's, that's the thing so the journey now i look at the journey and you look at the technology journey and the journey of semtech and you see you know that patience is paying off mm -hmm. but at, along the journey you know there were times when my board would sit back with me and say mohan this is we must be screwed up, but this is not working. I mean, we're not, this is not generating return. This is, you know, is it really um, gonna, gonna return the investment? We, um, are we gonna get the return on this investment? Is it worth continuing? You know, I've done a number of acquisitions along the way, quite sizable, you know, we've done a half a billion dollar acquisition. We've done a number of hundred million dollar acquisitions. And quite often the board would say to me, well, you know, is it really paying off? And I always felt whenever there was a sense of impatience, Mm -hmm. It was my job to get the board together and talk about it and say, look, you know, uh, what is what is the impatience? What are we trying to do here? Right. And when you're trying to create a smarter planet and you're trying to uh, do something that is, you know, very unique and very revolutionary, you can't put a timeline on it. You know, yeah. you have to you have to you have to uh, really uh, be uh, willing um, to be patient. Be aggressive, you know. Be creative, but also to uh, uh, to uh, to drive um, innovation. And we're going to talk about that, I think. And and innovation comes from you know being patient. You can't mm -hmm. rush into these things. And many of the problems and challenges the U.S. has today is because we're impatient. You know, mm -hmm. honestly, the U.S. was leaders in every aspect of technology. You can you can talk to me about any aspect: software, hardware, chips. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, anything, but our impatience as a country has led us to give up that leadership. Mm -hmm. And now full cycle, you go forward and you look at where we are today, we're all scratching our head and say, well, how did we allow this to happen? Well, it's impatience. We just yeah. want to make a quick buck. You know, we want to always 
stop things and, and move things quickly. So anyway, coming back to Semtec, we've been very patient. Our shareholders are very happy now, They're very pleased and very excited about the future because I think our journey is just beginning. And I've told them that and said, you know, we, you've been patient now for many years. Now you're going to start to see the rewards of that. So let me ask you a question. I know we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but just listening to you share this story about speaking with your boards of directors, um, obviously other key leaders in the organization, it strikes me that being able to get folks to be patient really requires extraordinary communication skills. And I don't know, um, particularly given we have a lot of students in the audience tonight, if you could talk about the kinds of uh, communication strategies that helps a board and helps other leaders that you're working with on the leadership team understand the need and then we'll go and then we'll go right into the innovation and technology yeah well uh, you know i think it's honesty you know yeah we can call it communication style or clarity and, and things like that but a lot of it is honesty you know it's mm -hmm. it's about you know from the heart you know really what we're trying to achieve as a company and what we feel are our values as a company and um ensuring that i'm in trying to ensure that my board and my directors also share those values. Right. And so if they share those values, there's no problem. If they don't, and we have had directors who have, have always found, well, you know, I'm not sure that they um, share the same core values as me or, or the other um, uh, directors, you know, then it's my job to kind of encourage them to move on to join, you know, someone else, right? So, <laughs> and, and, and leave Semtech, and, and that's not easy, but, um, uh, sometimes necessary and and, sure. and that's that's uh, also a um you know it, it's a it's a tough part of being a public company but you know when i have my investors behind me and my shareholders behind me which i do and i make a lot of i do a lot make a lot of effort to make sure that my shareholders are happy and they and they and i'm listening to them um mm -hmm. uh, then uh, then you can achieve anything really yeah yeah, thanks for sharing that. So let's move right into the innovation and technology because I know um, you guys do a lot of work in the IoT, the the uh, innovation of things, uh, the Internet of Things. Um, it's hard not to get excited about the technology that Semtech developed. And, and you and I have talked about leading innovation in very ethical ways. So as you work in this Internet of Things space and you get real excited about what's possible there, Talk to us about your baby. Talk to us about Laura, because I remember when we talked about it, your enthusiasm about changing the world mm -hmm. through this Laura technology just came across loud and clear. Um, how are you changing the supply chain and providing a chance for you to really walk the talk and sustainability with Laura? Well, so let's let's talk about how we got there first. So, so um, you know, innovation for me is really about. Uh, converting great ideas and visions into into products and that's that's what it is for us that's the that's the thought and the concept now fortunately when i joined semtech you know we had a good balance sheet so we had cash we had we were cash generating cash so to that extent to some extent i was um already at an advantage because if you have cash and if you have a good balance sheet you have a a position and a situation where you can you can you know you can you can take some de use some degrees of freedom take some strategies acquire some companies do some take some risk and do some things and so i used that opportunity i you know immediately took um uh, you know delved into the balance sheet and i said okay let's go do some acquisitions let's go find some some innovative technologies uh sort um um kind of our own organization out and focus the company on smarter planet initiatives mm -hmm. simple as that and so when you think about, well, what does that mean? Smarter planet initiatives, right? Well, I can tell you today, if you look at the world's issues, whether it be climate change, natural resources, whether it be energy efficiency, you know, pollution control, you know, hunger, you know, what, whatever it is, technology has a role to play. Mm -hmm. It's just simply a question of whether the politicians, you know, the, the world that we live in, if people really want to want to you know make the investments and, and have the patience and and want to um, uh, really solve the problems and are willing to to to, to kind of drive the uh, technology to help us in those areas. So Semtech, you know, we we put an emphasis on that. We said, look, let's let's figure this out from our perspective. And so we created a um, what is called a long range radio. Uh, it's a very low power radio. So this radio, this is a radio, it's just like a Wi-Fi radio or a mm -hmm. Bluetooth radio or anything else. 
uh, uh, and I can tell you, my, my grandkids know more about this stuff than, than I do these days because they, they just are very good at using technology. But what we have designed and developed over many years now is the ability to have very, very long range communication. So we have communication from a satellite, for example, down to earth, um, but extremely low power. So, so this low power, long range radios enable what we call low power wide area networks, which is the ability to create networks of sensors, low power sensors. And it's a very simple concept. You can create hundreds of thousands of, of sensors connected together um, that can tell the network and tell the cloud and tell you personally, if you want to, or an enterprise when there's a problem, where mm -hmm. there's a flood, where there's heat, where there's fire, where there's, where there's um, danger, where there's safety issue, where there's uh, you know, an earthquake uh, about to happen. You know, it can even predict you know, some things. And then you can take action. So, so we've developed this technology. It's been um, deployed now globally. Uh, pretty much every country in the world is using LoRa. It's got tremendous momentum. Um, and really a lot of the use cases around the technology are for Smarter Planet initiatives. So we're very proud of that. We're very uh, tightly coupled with the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainable uh, Development Goals, mm -hmm. uh, all the ESG efforts in the world today. So, um, and, and, you know, we're not stopping, you know, Laura is on its own is an innovative platform, but innovation is, you know, I've always said it's kind of like a butterfly, right? You know, it goes one direction, then it goes another direction, and it goes another, you're not quite sure where it's going to end up. Uh, but, but sometimes you have to kind of let it, let it, let the journey play itself out. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that's the beauty about it. And so for the younger people in the audience who are thinking of starting their own business or doing something creative, you know, don't let people convince you that things are impossible. You know, it's, uh, I can tell you many stories about, you know, my journey where, you know, I sat down with an engineer and we were thinking about uh, 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 developing a uh, search engine pre-Google. Yeah. Pre Google. This was before Google. And this is when the internet first came out and we almost did it. But, you know, our own competitive analysis showed us there was InfoSeek and Lycos and Yahoo and there was a whole bunch of companies. It was too, we were going to be late. And of course, along comes Google and shows everybody how to do it. So it's like, you know, you, you sometimes you have to, you have to take risk and you have to be willing to, again, be patient. Um, but that's innovation. And so the Laura platform we've developed now is much about kind of abandoning the old technologies and old processes and old systems and, and replacing them with new ones. And LoRa on its own, the deployment of LoRa around the world can save you know, billions of dollars of energy um, wastage, can, can save billions of um, uh, dollars in terms of carbon emissions. It can, it, there's just so many uh, opportunities to use it. And that's what we're, we're seeing now. So we're, we're very excited. Can you give us a couple of examples of how, I know um, you're passionate about the sustainable development goals, just like in the College of Business Administration, we always define sustainability by the operationalization of those 17 goals. And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about some of the case, the use cases of how Laura is being, making an impact on the SDGs. Yeah, yeah. So because of the ability to, the way Laura works, is a sensor, a LoRa sensor can go to sleep. It just sleeps mm -hmm. and it does nothing, you know? And you say, well, okay, so what's the value? It's not doing anything. But when there's an event, it wakes up. So mm -hmm. for example, how many times you walk across, uh, you know, on a sunny day, you'll be walking on the road and you'll see sprinklers going off, right? When it's after it's rained, you know, and the, or, or raining and the sprinklers are still going off. And you sit back and say, well, that's a waste, right? Or when you're out in the light, you know, and the, the lights come on, you know, and, or, you know, things like that. Right. I can give you, I can give you a thousand examples. Uh, water leakage in, in, in industrial environments, you know, um, uh, predict even maintenance, you know, technologies, uh, manufacturing environments. Typically, uh, when a machine goes down, they shut down the line, they right. replace the machine. Okay, all of that inefficiency, you know, Laura just solves a lot of issues by mm -hmm. saying, hey, wake up, tell someone there's a problem and come fix the problem before you, know, you have to do it. Uh, and, and the beauty about Laura is it's extremely low power. So right. we have a customer, for example, that has you know, uh, agriculture uh, rubber plantations in Asia. And these rubber plantations, they, the rubber comes down into a pot in the, in the, on a tree 
and when the pot is full, somebody has to go out and you know take out the rubber mm -hmm. and 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 uh, have to be refilled. So they decide, well, the manual labor that's doing this is extremely expensive, very painful, very tough on these um, laborers. Let's automate it. So they put cellular technology, cellular technology uh, sensors around all of these uh, things. The problem is with cellular, it's very battery hung, uh, power. It, it generates a lot of power, a lo lot of energy, very power consumption, a lot of high power consumption. And that's not what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they replaced it with Laura and they found, hey, this is perfect. Laura is perfect because when the pot is full, it just sends out a signal and tells you, hey, come, come replace it. Uh, we've had, I can tell you, I can go so through so many stories. Similar oh, no, no, stories. sure. Um, I know one of the things that we talked about that was of particular interest when you think about managing downstream on the supply chain is the notion of how you can use it for ethical sourcing. Um, is there a case use you could share that really demonstrates how the innovation and the technology actually can help with downstream suppliers around ethical sourcing? Yeah, so, you know, so the supply chain, uh, first of all, around um, the semiconductors at the moment is extremely, it's, it's, a, it's a subject on its own because of the, all of the, um, you know, issues around chip supply. And a lot of that is tied to the geopolitical environment mm -hmm. we're in and, and the world we're in. But that's um, a key part of, you know, what we're trying to do with Laura is uh, to really enable uh, countries to use the technology to enable whatever they want to use. I mean, Laura is just a radio. It's a simple radio, but because of the low power consumption and the range, it allows, uh, you know, countries to kind of solve their specific problems, whether right. it be pollution, whether it be natural energy, whether it be uh, natural resources, you know, those type of things. So, and that's why we're seeing the success of it, but on the supply chain side as well, you know, we have logistics and nightmares around the world. And again, you know, um, the technology is there to solve these issues, but mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, governments haven't uh, made it a priority. And, mm -hmm. and therefore, when you don't make things a priority, you know, you, you realize only when it's too late, that, okay, you can, now you have a problem. So now we have all these logistics problems around the world and everybody's realizing, well, okay, we, we, we don't have efficient systems, we need to improve on that, and technology has a role to play in that. And I think that's, again, you know, Laura's role in tracking um, assets, whether they be uh, pallets or whether they be, you know, uh, engines or, or whatever, mm -hmm. it's extremely good technology for that. You can, you can track an asset from indoors um, uh, to external outdoors, uh, Laura is a, um, uh, doesn't need line of sight. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it can go through walls, it can go to basements, into attics um, and, and things like that. So it really is a very good technology for that. But I don't want to spend the whole time talking about the Laura technology. It sounds, it sounds like I'm trying to sell the technology. No, it's no, just no, no. I just, I, I appreciated all, all of the different issues. Well, well, let's talk about as a leader, what kinds of things keep you up at night, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Interestingly enough, um, I was attending an international business forum and awards ceremony earlier today. And a lot of the leaders on the panel were really talking about global manufacturing. And even tomorrow, shout out for all of you in the room. Tomorrow, we're going to do a whole symposium from 12 to 3 on the supply chain and sustainability. Um, but the challenges that were being discussed by the panelists were, you know, incredible. They talked about leaders really facing a radically changing world. You've mentioned geopolitics, supply chain concerns. I mean, right around the corner here, we have, uh, you know, lots of ships hanging out in the port, which is driving prices up and making our downstream manufacturers a little nervous. The SDGs, managing a pandemic. They're big issues and they're impacting us as a global community. Yeah. Well, so um, uh, when I look at, so first of all, what keeps me up at night, I don't worry about stuff that I can't control, you know, and, and I always tell, you know, my team and, and other leaders that, you know, if you can't control something, don't worry about it. It, it just, it's not worth worrying about. So um, um, generally, I don't worry about things related to the business. Uh, for me, uh, you know, if if there's an area of uh, concern, it would be when a customer calls me. You know, hey, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about that. Or you know, this is a problem. That's when I would be worried. But if I don't get a call from a customer, um, oh, I hon, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. 
and you don't have me. I'm sorry. We had um, <laughs> we had a technology problem where um, okay. I was kicked off my uh, my big computer, but I'm now on my laptop, so we're good. Um, and I think I was asking you what was keeping you up at night, and I know you were sharing some of that information. Yeah. So I was just saying that I don't, you know, I don't really, uh, I sleep very well. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's the wine, but I sleep very well. But uh, I don't uh, have any problem. You know, the, the only, uh, you know, obviously, if I my priorities are my family. So mm -hmm. if my family has an issue, something sick or whatever, then that's that's a worry for me. My second priority is my employees. You know, my employees are not doing well, then I'm worried and I, you know, won't sleep, but, um, and my customers, um, but, you know, so I, I prioritize like that, but generally if something happens that's outside, my, uh, outside of my control, and if we take a look at, you know, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of stuff that's outside of our control, you know, the geopolitical situation, not, not, nothing we can do about that. Uh, the pandemic, you know, nothing we can do about that, you know, countries going into lockdown, um, not a lot I can do about that. So, so we don't worry about that. And I always tell, um, you know, my employees, so one of the beauties about being in a, in a you know, slightly larger company that has a good balance sheet and, and you know, it's very profitable and cash flow uh, generates a lot of cash and stuff like that, that. The employees don't need to worry, you know? So when the pandemic first started, for example, I told everybody, I said to all the employees, do not worry. You all have a job. You don't need to worry. The compensation is going to be fine. The company's going to do fine. Just go relax, right? And just go enjoy it and then use the time at home. And, you know, I would still get questions from employees every sure. quarter. Oh, what, how long is this going to last? Are we going to be able to? Are we going to, are we worried? I'm worried about losing my job. You know, I would say, look, just, just chill, okay? We didn't lay off anybody um, in that period. We, and still today, we, we haven't really laid off anybody for um, due to the pandemic. Uh, um, and, and, you know, we've recovered really well. The business has actually done very extremely well. But mm -hmm. I think part of the thing you learn in leadership and, and as a business is that if something's out of your control, you know, you can't um, worry about that and get anxiety about it. And, and if you do as a leader, your, your leaders, your own managers and executives are going to also feel that and, and they're going to make poor decisions. And so, so my philosophy always is, you know, just just let's make calm decisions, let's make relaxed decisions, let's make a team decision, uh, and help each other as a company. You know, you always look for how can you, um, uh, you know, try to share your experiences with others. So during this period, you know, they don't feel so anxious. So when the pandemic first started, for example. And people were dying, right? And we were worried. I mean, how many people are dying? I mean, blah, blah, blah. so I would share with my employees. Well, you know, I'm a Tamil from Sri Lanka. You know, we had a civil war. You know, tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are dying in a day. There's a tsunami. You know, a tsunami in, in Sri Lanka happened. You know, uh, in in Asia, and you know, half a million people die in in a, a couple of days, right? So, you know, just take a deep breath. You know, okay, you know, just relax, you know, just kind of put things into perspective. We're all, um, you know, able to get through this and just kind of do it as a team. And the employees loved it. I mean, they, they really were very appreciative of it. And I think that's where, you know, when you, you talk about, you know, what keeps you up, up, up at night, I worry more about my employees staying, you know, what, how do they sleep and what's keeping them up at night? Because um, I know that I generally have no no worries about sleeping. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's good to have a sense of, you know, how you managing um, anxiety and employees, particularly during such a turbulent time in our, in our business landscape and certainly in the global community. Interestingly, is when Nola opened our uh, session tonight, she talked a little bit about, she talked a little bit about uh, our mission to advance knowledge, develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the, in the global community. And, you know, based on the breadth and depth of experience you shared with us so far and, and your, your comments uh, just a few minutes ago talking about um, making your employees feel strong, I mean, really demonstrating creative confidence. I'm wondering if you could share some of those other critical moments in your career where you've had to take that deep breath, show that creative confidence, and then weigh the risks and decisions. I mean, clearly your bottom line would have been improved had you done layoffs, you chose not to do that during the pandemic. I'm, I'm not aware of other decisions you might've made, but, but how do you really show that moral courage? What are examples in your career where you've had to really 
look at your values, let those guide the decisions, and then come across and, and manage the business. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that actually even more so than the pandemic, the geopolitical um, issues have been more challenging for us and for me. You know, we have, we're a very global company. We spent many years developing uh, very good relationships in some of these other geographical locations like China, for example, where we've, we've built a very strong team in China. And so when the whole China, US, uh, geo um, issues can, started to emerge and, you know, tariffs and, and you know, just kind of um, battling uh, here and there. My employees in China who are US, uh, who are uh, employees of a US company, very committed to Semtech, you know, they would ask me and say, hey, Mohan, we're, we're, we're worried, mm -hmm. right? Because we're Chinese in, a, in China, employed by a US company, and we're trying to sell U.S. products to our Chinese customers, and everybody around us is is you know there's, there's all this you know noise about hey don't buy U.S. don't you know the U.S. is a bad bad partner and you know, blah 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 and you know so I took the opportunity that was a, that and that's very challenging you know and, and, mm -hmm. and quite um, quite difficult problem because um, you sit back and I was kind of understanding look, our employees are committed to a company, but at the same time, they're, they're, their community is, is pushing them and, and you know, kind of starting to feel against them. So we took some actions immediately. Mm -hmm. you know, I gave them very big uh, increases in compensation <laughs> to help them. Right? And, and I said to them, look, you know, um, we're going to support you. We sent uh, more people over there. We hired more people. We actually did more in China than we've ever done before. Uh, we talked to the customers as well and said, look, we're committed to supporting them, uh, regardless of what happens geopolitically, you know, we have a, a job to do and, and we're partners in this and thing. And, you know, at the same time, you know, we're a US company. So I'm sitting there with my board saying, you know, we, we have to also look at what happens if, you know, um, the China government decides can't buy US components or US government decides, okay, you can't sell into China anymore then we as a company have to also look at other things, right? So uh, we started to look at creative strategies about uh, other emerging geographies and, and things like that. And so very, very unique situation. I mean, I've been in this industry 40 years. I've never seen that type of geopolitical environment um, uh, as bad as this anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. And then, and then a year after the pandemic. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because in business, and I would encourage all of the students to always, when you're thinking of business, you always do risk profiles and risk management and risk theory about what's going to happen and, you know, what are the risks of, of these things. And I do that all the time with my board. And we went back and looked mm -hmm. and none of us, we, I mean, we have 12 guys in, on my board. We, we do, we do a, a session of risk management. None of us had geopolitical uh, issues, at least to the extreme that had happened. And a pandemic on there. I mean, we just, <laughs> none of us so, put a best so, one. <laughs> I know. So, so we sit back now, and I'm sitting there to, with my board and saying, "Well, the next ten years, I think there's going to be an alien come down, and uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to end up uh, going to battle in, against someone in Mars." And you know, we're we're thinking of the worst, the most creative things we can possibly think of. To oh, I to, uh, love it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really uh, change the change the mindset of the board in terms of risk management. Well, that, 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 that reminds me for any faculty in the room. So you think we should be running simulations and uh, crisis management situations with our students where we really do ask them to what's the worst possible, I mean, aliens come down and start taking over. I mean, I'm reminded of that. Well, I, I will tell you the pandemic is, is an incredible um, case study because, right. so, you know, here we are running a business and normally, okay, every now and again, one of our manufacturing partners will go down or they'll have a fire in the fire plant or, you know, and you'll have a supply chain issue for a lot while. But if you think about it, for the whole of the first quarter of 2020, China shut down. China shut down. I mean, it went into lockdown. And then it started to open up. Malaysia locked down, you know, Taiwan locked down and, you know, Korea locked down and then the U.S. locked down. Dominoes, yeah. <laughs> And, and you're seeing you're seeing a whole country is locked down. It's not just manufacturing supply chains. The whole country is locked down. Right. And right. Um, 
that's an incredibly difficult and creative. You have to be very creative to find, you know, alternative solutions to that. But it's it's a it's a good case study because if you look at it, uh, you know, what it what it does is it it really um, uh, the companies that come out of that pandemic and do well are the ones that are financially stable. You know, they have good balance sheets. They have a, a good um, stable businesses. Um, they're diversified generally. Uh, you know, they're not dependent on one customer or one product or one region, you know, uh, and things like that. So in essence, the, it really um, supports the fundamental, uh, you know, kind of uh, tenants of good business, I think. Sure, sure. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's funny, it was reminding me of um, in that early quarter when all of this started to happen in th that March. And I remember even sitting down with all our business leader, uh, with all of the, uh, the chairs of the business school and a number of our staff members. And we kept thinking, oh, in three weeks, everything will be up and running again. So this is really a short term solution. And I remember asking the question of, of my team, what if? What if we were going to be virtual? How would the whole educational process change? And how do we reorganize and re-strategize so we can keep adding value to our students? And it, it's always interesting to speak with a, a C-suite leader to find out what those conversations look like those first few weeks of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, the first few weeks, it was more, okay, let's just wait and see what happens. Right. But I think as we got into it, we, we one of the things that we did very well, and I, um, you know, I'm taking the credit for it because I tell my board, you know, I've been in this industry for a long time. So I anticipated that we were gonna have supply chain issues. So we put in a bunch of inventory uh, prior ah. to this happening. So now so everybody's it's saying- different uh, from just in time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we don't have a problem delivering to our customers. And so it's kind of funny when I look at that and I say, well, we did it because when, when in the chip business, when, when you have a manufacturing um, line and you shut it down, you don't start it. It's not like you switch on, a, put on a switch and it comes on the following day. You know, this is a process that takes weeks, months, right, to, to get right. And then typically, if you start up a manufacturing line, you may have poor yields, you may have problems. And, and so all of this stuff means that whatever happened during that pandemic, uh, in addition to the fact that the demand went away and the supply, you suddenly have nothing. As it comes back and the demand is now exaggerated because you, you're catching up from the demand for you, you lost over that period, the supply chain also has to catch up. And sometimes it might take a year or two to do that. And that's exactly what's happened in the semiconductor industry now. So uh, it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation, but it will catch up. It will, it will get there. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping your ships start to deliver that are sitting out there in the port. Um, you know, it's about 6.15. We have about 15 minutes left. And I noticed there's a number of questions in the Q&A. I think Nola can see them. So Nola, if you could help moderate the questions that our audience has for Mohan, I'd really appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll go with the first question. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about global um, Mohan, which was great. Um, so in terms of running a global company, are there any other challenges your company might face and expanding, you know, or or any examples that you've had, any challenges you've um, you've faced, um, other than any challenges you've you've um, you've had with China, which is the example that you gave. Well, so when we uh, expand globally, um, you know, we're always looking for um, talent and resources on the engineering side. Is typically what we're doing, looking for you know people who can help us design uh, more chips and different types of chips. Uh, it's a very limited uh, set of resources in the world, uh, actually. And, you know, we were looking for more and more graduates to come out. And so we tend to go look for setting up design centers close to good colleges and, that are generating good engineering talent. Uh, but that is a, <laughs> that is a big um, challenge for us is always finding the right set of talents. Uh, I would say every region has its own challenges. You know, uh, Asia has challenges, Europe has different challenges. Um, but you can overcome them. Uh, you know, um, one has to be sensitive to the cultural issues, uh, uh, but also the geopolitical issues, as we talked about now. Um, but Semtech's well known in the world. I mean, we have customers around the world. Uh, Laura, for example, is a global technology that's used in every country in the world. And so, um, you know, we don't typically have major problems, but I, I, I do think that you know, the world has changed now after this geopolitical situation and the supply chains. Some of our customers don't want a, a China-based supply chain, for example. 
They just don't want it anymore. They don't want that risk in the future. They would much prefer to have a uh, Europe or if it's Asia, you know, through Japan or Korea or Taiwan. Um, and that um, doesn't happen overnight. So you have to kind of think through that uh, carefully. But yeah, I think um, recruiting of um, experienced, capable engineering talent is, is, a, is probably the, the biggest issue for us. I see. That's, that's great. Um, well, it's a challenge, definitely. Um, so in relation to Laura, what does the short term and long term future for Laura look like? Well, short term, Laura is doing extremely well. I mean, it's it's uh, being used in hundreds of different applications now. Uh, it's um, being used for monitoring, you know, efficiency of resources, uh, energy efficiency. It's being used for safety applications. It's being used for, as I mentioned, the SDG, you know, UN's SDG initiatives. A lot of the initiatives there are tied to. Uh, applications that Laura is a good fit for just because of the low power and the long range. In the long run, you know, our expectation is uh, Laura is going to be everywhere. I mean, I have it in my house. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, but, uh, you know, I, I use it everywhere. It's, it's, it can be used to, I, I know before uh, anybody comes anywhere close to my door, who they are where, and, and, and somebody's come uh, entered. Because on my driveway, I have a LoRa, it's, it's a ring, a ring-based LoRa light. And, and the light comes on and it tells me immediately that someone's walking up my driveway or there's a car coming up my driveway. And so things like that, LoRa is very unique, very, very um, uh, good technology for those type of things. You know, Amazon has uh, announced that it's gonna use a LoRa for its sidewalk network uh, that's gonna come out, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, so you'll have an echo with a side uh, LoRa uh, technology in it that will allow you to connect the LoRa, their ecosystem to sensors around your home um, and track your kids, track your pets, you know, all these type of things. So very exciting. Yeah. That's wonderful. Um, thank you, Yitang, for this question. How do you foster a united work environment when the world around us seems to be more divided than ever? Aside from compensation, does company morale and dedication to CSR help? Well, so I think, um, you know, we, we always focus on teamwork in the company. I mean, that's always been the uh, mantra that I've had. And, and even as I mentioned with this geopolitical situation, um, we were proactive in going out and talking to our Chinese employees and reminding them that we as a company are behind them. And they, you know, we, we are to support them. We're going to keep them motivated. We're going to compensate them more. We're going to figure out how to make sure that anything um, that they're troubled with in their um, communities or in their country, we're going to address and we're going to do it proactively. <laughs> And that's what we did, and we we've done it in, in in India, we've done it in Mexico, we've done it in you know France. You, you name the region. That's what we do, and and you have to do it that way. Um, and they really appreciate it. I, I think that we have not lost any employees in in China through the geopolitical um, uh, issues, which was a surprise to me, to be honest with you. I, I thought that we would, but we didn't. And uh, I think it was uh, just about being proactive about. Uh, sharing with them that, you know, we don't all support, you know, the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, rhetoric that's being thrown back and forward. Uh, you know, we, we care very much about our employees and mm -hmm. we care very much about people. And, you know, um, the politics aside, regardless of which way you, you what do you believe in, you know, um, we have a duty to support our employees and our people. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, questions just, keep coming. Yeah, there's more questions. Yeah, there's there's more questions <laughs> here. So um, one just came through that's rather interesting. Um, what strategies are you implementing uh, to face or, and overcome the worldwide chip shortage that we've been facing? Well, so you know, it's uh, that's that's um, something that if you look at, you have to look at it on a case by case basis. And if you look at the situation where there are chip shortages, a lot of the chip shortages are due to manufacturers that shut down their manufacturing lines through the pandemic and are now catching up. Now, a good example of that is the automotive industry. If you look at the automotive industry, when the pandemic first happened, everybody's working from home. Nobody wants to buy a vehicle, right? I mean, you know, the demand for vehicles just dropped tremendously. 
So when, when the demand dropped tremendously, there's an automatic um, kind of uh, approach, which is, you know, drives the equilibrium of a much lower supply to hit the lower demand. Of course, when the pandemic started to get, you know, better and, and, and things, people started to go, uh, start travel more and then start to get out a bit and, hey, we want to buy vehicles. Well, what's in inventory is what you're going to get, right? Now, if you want to buy more vehicle, then you have to start the whole process. Demand has to increase and then you get the supply chain, which will come into equilibrium. And that's what, you, what you're going to find. And, and we're, we're going through that now. So, so now from Semtech standpoint, as I mentioned, we took the, made the decision early on, we're going to build a lot of inventory. The automotive manufacturers or the automotive chip suppliers, they didn't do that. So, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the only thing I would say from, from our standpoint, we're not really suffering that much from shortages uh, at the moment. Um, if the situation continues, you know, a year from now, uh, two years from now, it will start to hurt us as well. But uh, at this point in time, I think most of the manufacturers are starting to, you know, increase their capacity and, and try to get more chips out. And so it, it, it will take time, but there will be a catch up. The only thing with uh, semiconductors to remember, semiconductor manufacturing is extremely expensive. You mm -hmm. have to put in tens of billions of dollars uh, in some cases, hundreds of billions of dollars to really be able to support massive amounts of chips. And, you know, it's, it's not a small number, right? So, so you find that um, sometimes the commitment to make those type of investments is not always there. Okay, so that's a, that's a key point to understand. And the semiconductor industry is a very capital intensive industry, which requires a lot of investments. Um, I can spend hours with anybody who wants to talk about it on um, semiconductor manufacturing in the US, which we used to do uh, at a very heavy level. A lot of it was driven by the government and the US used to be way ahead of everybody else. Um, but again, as I was talking about that short termism started to come in and, and less and less semiconductor investments were going in. And so it enabled the rest of the world to kind of uh, take over in that, um, in that sense. And, we, we're, we're paying for that now. Uh, we'll get that, we'll get there though. Yeah. Well, Han, can I just ask a follow-up question on that? So was it leadership foresight that put you in a position where you had all of that supply um, or happy accident? No, it was experience, I would say. So I've seen these cycles before. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so when, when, for example, you see that, um, you know, countries are shutting down or we're gonna be shut down or they're going to slow down their manufacturing uh, you know, we just made the decision, look, you, we're in the type of the cycle, end of the cycle where demand is going up, supply is constrained or getting to be constrained. Let's put more inventory in place. Now, right. we can do that as a company. We have a good balance sheet. We have a lot of cash. So, you know, putting an additional $100 million of, of inventory, uh, uh, you know, uh, in place for us is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, now, my investors don't necessarily like it because it's, you know, that's, that's my cash. But now uh, they say, well, that's a brilliant move. Oh, that was brilliant. <laughs> you know, you, you've got you know, all the inventory and you're generating cash and you're doing great. And, you know, yeah, you're yeah. Supply constraints, yeah. So now you can tell them you told them so. There you go. <laughs> um, I know we're, uh, we have about five minutes left. Um, was there one more question that a student asked, Nola, that we want to um, There's. With? Yeah, there's, well, I'll, I'll ask this last one. Um, what other advice do you have for our students in terms of either emerging technologies and also their career? Yeah, I mean, so, so to me, you know, innovation is really about um, just kind of replacing the old with new. Think about things like that and, and not, not to worry about um, the blockages you know, what I call blockages. Innovation blockages are things like budgets, you know, timelines, you know, uh, you know, risks, you know, things, things like not to worry about that, but to kind of find a way to break through mm -hmm. uh, those, those blockages and then to have fun. You know, and business is about having fun. If you can't see that I'm having fun, you know, it's the only reason I stay as the CEO and, and keep working hard is because I'm having fun. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, and it's fun to really generate and innovate technology and create technology that is genuinely helping the planet. I mean, it's, it's really a, a nice thing uh, uh, to be able to do that. Um, 
We have, you know, again, use cases where we have LoRa being used to save rhinos in Africa. You know, we have um, LoRa being used to help marine life in, in uh, you know, in, in certain countries, parts of the world. I mean, you can, the list goes on and, and you could do your own research and look at it, but that's fun. Mm -hmm. For me, for me, that's fun. You know, it's, it's enjoyable. It's great. It's obviously it's financially rewarding also for the company, but it's, it's more about uh, enjoying it and, and, and enjoying the journey. So I, that's my advice to students is, you know, uh, have fun with it. Don't, uh, um, don't get um, uh, set in a box, you know, kind of figure out how to get out of the box, be creative and um, kind of drive your own, your own journey. Yeah. Oh, Mohan, thanks so much for sharing that. I mean, I, I remember reading uh, somebody once said, and I'm not sure who it was, but, you know, if you're passionate about your work, it'll never feel like work, something to that effect. And that certainly comes out loud and clear as you share your journey, what keeps you ticking, how you keep your granddaughters happy, knowing that you're doing something to really improve the planet. Um, on behalf of the college and the university, we want to Thank you for the time that you spent with us tonight. Really appreciate all of that and um, look forward to uh, keeping up the relationship and letting you know we have an engineering school here as well as a business school with a lot of uh, graduate students and undergrads. And I have a funny feeling that after listening to you tonight, uh, you may just see uh, some LMU uh, students that are and their resumes uh, coming your way, but we'll keep up the conversation. 